Cool. Let's jump into the live portion of this. With this live portion, what we'll do today is we're going to get a full working X planer project that with a couple clicks, you could have working with real hardware, real tiles, real movers. We'll interact with it. We'll define some points on these tiles. And then um, we'll have some a way to go and enable, disable these movers and then start our sequence. So we'll go through the full configuration of X Planer and then we'll run it. Eventually, we can link all of these things to TwinCAD HMI, which is a video that I'm hopeful is coming very, very soon. Jacob, very soon, very soon. <laughs> and uh, because that's all he has time to do is just make videos for us, which is awesome. Before I file new, we've got a couple things that you will need to do. The links are below. We'll need to install the latest version of TwinCat. I'm on 4024.29. We'll install the latest version of TF5890, the latest version of TF5400, uh, which is included, or that is the, the main package that includes TF5430. And within those two section, or those two extensions for uh, TwinCat, uh, they're all free, all available on the website, and all of the licenses are available in trial modes. Um, install those, and we'll have everything that we need to get going with this live view. So if you haven't done that yet, do that now and jump back into this video. Here we go. Now that those are installed, we'll file new project just like normal. I'm gonna make a new project here. You can name it whatever you want. I think TwinCat Project 4 looks perfect to me. Four is my lucky number, so that ah, it's, a, very it's, a, good. it's a sign. Yes, it is. It's a sign. This is going to go very smoothly, as it always does with live <laughs> software demonstrations. <laughs> as long as you don't get the blue screen and jump out, I'm fine. That's right. That's it. Everything is good. Before we jump into the Xplainer configurator, we just talked about the differences that if you actually had Xplainer hardware, which how you would scan those in. We also need to have some isolated cores on our workstation. So I've already done that, but I will walk you through briefly how to do it. And then as you set this, you will need to restart. So do that and then jump back on with us. To isolate your cores, do a read from target. It will, you will likely show if you're on a decent workstation, you will so probably between I'm guessing eight and 16, and we'll probably say 16 here, and we'll probably say zero here. So what you need to do, you click read from target, click set on target, and you want this to show four over in this right-hand side. You can do less. I'm hoping that everybody that is working on this has some cores available to give to this application. I would say the minimum that you could do in simulation, I would say, is two. So if you do need to do two, I think that's fine. Uh, we could try it later on. But I would say try and do three or four isolated cores. So, so x you requires doing... you, in simula even in simulation mode, it requires uh, isolated cores to, to work. It does, yes. Because if you, and this is something that we could talk about in a later, um, in, in a later session. But when you look at the way that the real time, is sharing processing power with Windows. When Windows jumps in and uses the resources, it really affects how XPlanner can compute what it needs to. And it is required that we complete everything we need to in under 250 microseconds. I would say probably under 230 for a little bit of room to spare. So, so that's very, very fast. And when we're dealing with Windows and messing around with Windows, that can add some challenges to the simulation. So I think it's best to isolate these cores. And uh, if you have four cores, you would look something like this, where there's a four in this in this side here. Don't be too concerned with this with this side that's shared. And what that just means is you're sharing that with Windows. If you only have three, then you uh, you that would look something like that. So then click set. I'm going to click cancel because I have already done this and then click restart. You will then restart your machine and jump back on with us to continue. So the very first thing you'll do when your project is loaded, when your solution is loaded, is scan hardware if you have any. So if you have hardware, devices, right click scan. I think that was in a previous session, a previous course, uh, when Jacob, you think you talked about this in your IO section, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, correct, correct. That's right, so if you haven't watched that, go watch it. We do not have any hardware. We're just hanging out on my laptop or on your workstation. So this we will skip, but that would be the first step if you did have real hardware. 
Okay, so our hardware is scanned or not scanned, and you can see here we don't have anything else within this tree. So we are in good shape. The next thing is in TwinCat, Xplainer, and Configurator. You'll also notice here I am in XAE Shell. You can use Visual Studio 2017 or 2019. I do have 2019 installed, but it is not required for anything that we're doing here. I really, I like to stay in, in XAE Shell unless there is a specific reason that you would need a functionality, you know, that does not exist here. So this is the Xplainer configurator that we talked about. This is a super powerful tool and really saves you an insane amount of time. So if you had hardware, you would click scan BTNs. We don't have hardware, so we can sorry, uh, forget sorry about it. Sorry to interrupt you, BTN, what, do you know what that's short for? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll keep that out of, of the video. <laughs> no, let me tell you, let, I, let me talk about that. So hang on, yeah. let me talk about that. Uh, Reset all, yes. So the first thing you would do is if you have hardware, you would click scan BTNs. BTNs are the ID numbers that are unique to each tile. So what you're doing here is when you click scan BTNs, you're actually going into the IO and it says, hey, where's all my explainer tiles and identify yourself. Who the heck are you? And then it will give us a nice list of all of these BTNs so that when we build our tile layout, we can assign a BTN or an ID number to each tile. So you can see here that if I select this tile here, assign a BTN, this would need to be, you know, whatever in the real world, this would need to be whatever ID number is that tile. So we obviously don't have any BTNs because we don't have any tiles, any, any hardware tiles, physical tiles. So we can forget about all of this um, at this point. So the BTN is um, kind of like an identity for, for each tile. That's unique. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. That's exactly right. One thing to think about is there are the BTNs are printed on the top of the tiles. They're also underneath the tiles. But if you are, you know, diving into an application, as you go to install these tiles, you know, physically on your machine bed, take the time to write down or even better, take a picture of the BTN so that when you sit down in software, you can just look at very easily, hey, look, you know, this is XQR or whatever the, the ID is. You can easily see that this tile, you know, in the left corner, what its ID is and then so on and so forth. So it saves a lot of time if you do that while you are um, installing the tiles on your machine bed. So maybe I a like stupid, to... maybe a stupid question, but, but uh, I, I know the movers are available in different sizes. Is, is it the same with tiles or the tiles are just one size? Right now, the tiles are just one size. Okay. So there was, if you've been following this product, there was a time, and Jacob, you probably remember this, where we had two different tiles. One tile would allow for continuous rotation and the other tiles would then be uh, lateral tiles. So the idea would be that the mover moves onto the rotation tile and then the rotation and then, you know, rotates maybe 90 or something or, or 180 and then moves off. But obviously now, as we talked about earlier, we don't need that anymore. And so right now we just have one tile and then you can make any layout that you want. And uh, with those tiles, they're 240 by 240 millimeters. And so uh, just stack them all together and make whatever layout that suits your um, application. So I like to click reset tile names. It just keeps things uh, clean so that um, what we are calling tile one, software is also calling tile one and everything stays nicely organized. And, uh, and then we move on. So area here is going to be the home for some new cool features. So right now we just hang out here and we can move on to mover. So with movers, we have, we'll click on create. And we have three styles of movers. You have 4220, which is the smallest, 4330, which is the middle sized mover, and 4550, which is the largest. So, to give you an idea, 4220 is one quarter. It's the same size as the quadrant of a mover. You can see here, he's a nice little guy. 4330 is about two thirds of a tile, and 4550 is the same size as one tile. Can you mix so them? You can, can you have small and, and, and big in the same uh, application? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great question. Yeah, you can have um, as many that you as you want of any or all of the, uh, the different sizes. So we'll hang out with the middle size today and uh, we'll just put one mover um, anywhere on the, uh, on the tile. Okay, so we're rocking and rolling. So in real time. So in the real time, we've already set, our, set up our cores to be isolated. And so we can scan CPUs. Yes, please. This is just going to say, hey, look, what resources do you have available? I'm gonna click reassign modules and the software is smart enough, the configurator, 
uh, is smart enough to say, hey, it's most optimum to split you guys up, to split you guys up, and you guys up. And it sets up all of our tasks for us on all of our proper cores. It sets up the timing for us. So all things that we used to have to do manually, but everything is done automatically for us. So we are in good shape at this point and we can click export. Yes, I do want to export. And this takes just a couple seconds here. So it actually selects the, the course and everything for us automatically and, and sets the correct cycle time and and all of That's it. right. So, so you don't have to do it manually like you would do, for example, like in, in the traditional motion accesses where, where you, you have to put them yourself. That's exactly right. Yep, that's, that's, that's exactly that's right. Very, that's very convenient. Yes, it's super convenient. So what this is saying here, it says system is running in simulation mode uh, or newest tile calibration source is missing. Well, you bet. We are running in simulation mode because we don't obviously have any hardware. So it, so, sorry, it recognizes some that. Some feedback. File from the Beckhoff website. It should be Beckhoff website, but it's... <laughs> you see. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Sorry, hey God, so I, I, I interrupted going... you. <laughs> this is amazing. Hold on, just one moment. Uh, I, I think I have OCD or something, you know. How do you catch that? I've looked at Jacob. I have looked at this no, window I, 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 no I, less I, than a thousand times. Yeah, I, I have OCD. I think so. I, when something isn't aligning or something is misspelled, then my uh, my brain is just immediately on that. And, and then, uh, I, like I, I said, and then the problem is I can't think of anything else than that. That's the problem I have, you know. And then I just have to s t say it. That's amazing. Okay, you're incredible. Um, no, no, no. It's it's really it's really torture. To <laughs> Before I was so rudely interrupted. Um, okay, so yeah. So what this is saying is we're running in simulation mode, or there is something missing. Well, nothing is missing. We're just simply running in simulation mode. So it knows that because it hasn't seen any hardware. What would pop up if we had hardware would be some uh, BML files. BML stands for Beckoff Machine Learning Files. And we would copy those files into a directory. And uh, maybe we can do that in a part two if people are interested in seeing what that looks like. So we are good to go here. And we press any key to continue. You can see configuration successfully exported to TwinCat. Oh, yeah. So, now I see that it's, uh, something popped up in the background there. Yes, it did. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yes, it did. So we're done with this at this point. Take this guy. Get Jump out of it. Okay. So we've got our X planer portion added to our project. You can see what this all looks like here. Obviously, we don't have any IO that just be physical IO, but we have everything that we need here for Xplainer to uh, run this in simulation. So the next thing to do is let's add some PLC code. So right click on PLC. So regarding the configuration, we really don't have to do anything manually here. So you do everything in the configurator and then it ex exports it to here. And, and the only thing we have to worry about here is actually the, the PLC code, the logic. That's exactly right. And then we'll do one more portion after the logic. Um, we just need to link the logic to the uh, um, to the explainer components. But yeah. after that, that's just a couple clicks. And yeah, like you said, the large majority, I would say 98% of what is required to get this configured is all done through that explainer configurator. And that happens automatically. So a super powerful uh, tool for this product. Yeah. So uh, I, I like. I think that, that that sounds very good because that's actually one of the scary. When I saw Explain, right, it of course looks. Yes. My, my brain just automatically thinks this is probably super complicated and it looks super advanced. But so far, it it feels like Beckhoff have really put a good uh, abstraction layer on top of, of all this complexity that's for surely there. <laughs> so it's it's easy for for people like me, you know, to just get into it and and work with it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's uh, that's that's exactly what I think we were that was our intention you know in releasing this is that you know as we talked about a little earlier in the video is that what we're doing you know magnetically levitating a mover in with maintaining six degrees of freedom where the mover can you know rotate it can go up down forward backward left right you know roll pitch doing all of that in code the math the physics uh behind that is you know mind-boggling right and and so you know, we had to develop a way to bring that functionality to people that, you know, don't have a PhD in physics. And so I think our developers have done a wonderful job with that uh, with that feature. So, yeah. So the next portion is just the logic. So we jump in. I named it PLC one. You can name it anything you want and uh, click OK. So this will put a just a default PLC. I think it's a great place to start. This should all be very familiar to everybody that is 
uh, that's gone through the other courses from Jacob. And as soon as that adds here, we can jump in and we will add our libraries. So under references here, you can see we have some default libraries. Let's click add library and we'll just type in XPL. And you will see we have the explainer utility library. Yes, please. Add library, type in physics. PHY, there's physics. And the last one we'll add is MC planar motion. Planar, and we see MC3 planar motion. Perfect. Good shape. So we've got our libraries now, and now we are ready to rock and roll uh, with our logic. So open up main, and uh, let's make some variables to start. So we've got, uh, get my cursor out of the way here. So we've got B start. And Jacob, I don't want to hear any attitude about my Hungarian notation. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I think Jacob hates that. Actually, I know he hates that. And so I'm going to use it now more often now that I know <laughs> he hates that. That's the right so. attitude. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few things that we need to do to make this uh, work. We've got B start, B, uh, let's do B enable. B uh, disable. These are just going to be some triggers to interact with our with our application. Um, let's do a B reset. And um, we need a case. And we need, well, we do need a mover. That'd be a good place to start. FB mover. And that is of type MC. Er, mover. Okay. Uh -huh. So there's a function block uh, for every instance of a mover. You create an instance of this function block then. That's right. Okay. And if you had, if you were using in 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 planar standard, you would do it slightly differently. Um, similar concept, but yes, if we had multiple movers, we would do R A Y. Yeah. Okay. You know, something like this. You know, if we yeah, had yeah. like this. Yeah. So for anybody that has, you know, if we have a bunch of movers, we would do something like that. We have one today. So we are just going to hang out with this guy here. All right, we need a mover and then uh, we need a feedback uh, structure. And so I'm gonna call that command feedback. That's just gonna tell us, hey, we're gonna give this mover a command and then we're going to look at that command feedback for the mover to report back that it has completed the command that we just gave it. And so that function block here is MC feedback. And I like to do ST mover state. So we can just put this at the top of our code so we can see what state the mover is in. Let's see. Oh my good. State. All right, we do need some positions to send our movers. So let's make some positions. ST mover positions. And we'll call that. We'll make that an array, one through five, and we'll call that positions X, Y, C, of type positions X, Y, C. Looks good. And then we do need to specify some dynamics. This will let us change the speed of the mover um, as it's going through our application. So let's do an FB dynamics. For a move and that's going to be dy and then yeah, my dynamic con dynamic constraint okay and positions xyc it is position xyc sorry about that all right Okay, and then we've got one more B Amex rotate. So we are going to have different uh, dynamics for a rotation, a continuous rotation. And so we will uh, 
add that. We'll specify those dynamics here. Maybe I'm going cool. ahead. Uh, maybe I'm going ahead a little bit of, of what you're gonna show, but I guess one of these objects uh, is what you're gonna you're gonna have to link this somewhere to the axis, right? That's correct. So we will link uh, this guy right here. This FB mover will get linked to this guy right here. Oh, so it's like an it's like an axis ref basically, but for that's for exactly it. what it is. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I I think the best way to describe it is an axis package, just yep. because obviously, right? It's six axes, basically. Yeah. 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 Um. So uh, yeah, so I I kind of call it an axis package. Oh yeah, but yes, right. Just... Yeah, exactly. I always think of axes because I also always relate it to the licensing costs you have. You know that you pay per axis, for instance. That's but, right. But, but yep. here it's different because it's of course obviously separate licenses for X planner compared to N nor That's normal right. numerical control axes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep, that's exactly right. So the last thing that we've got to, uh, as far as for our variables, is we need a st mover fc move c options. Cool. St move c options. So this is just a little structure that's going to have some details. Of jump this down so everybody can see going to there's not a nice way to move all of that over is there i don't think there is so sorry, ST movers, sorry, what do you want to do oh is there a nice way to move to tab all of this yeah, over yeah it is uh, so you hold do you want to tab it inwards or outwards uh, uh outwards like like do like take yeah, this guy you can do it yeah yeah so ho hold alt it, put your mouse pointer just after the, the colon after the, oh, oh you're kidding me hold yeah uh I'm going to include that in the video. All right, so here we go. So this is kind of ugly and I have OCD. So hold Alt, drag down and over, and then we can tab that over slightly so that we give this guy a little space. Cool. So mover C options, we were talking about that. Mover C options, this is just a structure that has a few details so that when we do want to go into continuous rotation, we can put some details of how many times we want to rotate, this, the direction we want to rotate, and things associated with that move, and that's all handled in that, uh, in that structure. So at this point, we are ready to rock and roll. Let's do a few things at the top that need to run cyclically. So we'll do fbmover.update, and we can open and close that method. We need a command so feedback. You, you don't call the function block body directly. You, you you have methods that you call on the function block. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we'll do a command feedback update. And then I like to do the mover state just for convenience. So st mover state is equal to fb mover dot mc to plc dot standard dot mover state it is bingo so yeah, it, it really feels like an access ref now because i saw this m n c uh, that's right the yep that's exactly right it's like yeah yep that's exactly right so as far as our just kind of our housekeeping that's really all we need there and now let's uh, make some triggers since everything is built with the OOP principle within these libraries. If you haven't had an opportunity to dive into that uh, programming, those programming principles, definitely uh, take the time to do that. I think that uh, you'll really enjoy kind of the way that, uh, you know, you can abstract code and it's just become so much more usable, so much more readable. And yes, so we will uh, do some of that here. So a few triggers that we need to that we need for our application. We're going to say if b enable, then we want to say fb mover dot enable. We're going to do a command feedback. Give it that command feedback that we have instantiated, and then we want to say b enable false. So what we're doing here is if we tell it to enable, I want it to call this enable method one time. I'm going to pass in the feedback structure for it to respond, and then I'm going to turn that back false. So it's just going to be a one shot, and then uh, and it won't sit there and cyclically call the enable, fun the enable method. Okay, so we just need to call enable one time, 
and we're going to utilize this style of command uh, for the rest of what we're doing. So we'll do two more of these if B. So this basically disabled. this basically linked the mover together with the command feedback. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. So if FB mover disable. A B my cursor. Right? You could probably copy and paste this, but enough of it it's all different just enough that it's kind of I'm not sure it saves you any time. Um, one thing to note, if we just go ahead and open and close this, uh, you will see here that he is requiring exactly one input. Mm -hmm. So we'll give that its command feedback. If you don't have a command feedback instantiated, you can always give it a zero. All right, so for our housekeeping here, we've got this, these portions that will update cyclically, these methods that update cyclically. We've got our triggers to enable the mover, to disable the mover, and to reset the mover. Whoops, forgot this here. Reset. Wow. Rock and roll. All right. And so you you would have a feedback as well for every for every mover then, I assume. Uh, that's exactly right. Yep. And uh, X Planer standard will handle a lot of that for you. So mm -hmm. this would be kind of a, oh, I don't, I wouldn't call it brute force, but this is just going to be a, a low level uh, control. So we're not dealing with any queuing or collision avoidance or things like that. But, you know, with the, with X Planer standard and with tracks and things that we'll get into and in, in the next video, that all is, is handled as well. So this is definitely just an, you know, going to get you moving and get, you know, for uh, feasibility studies to understand, you know, hey, is this a good fit for our application? You will likely be able to do everything that you need to do with these libraries here that we're showing. So, okay. and then, sorry, sorry for another question. Is it at this point when you enable it that the levitation happens or is enable something else? Yes, it does. It's at this yeah. point where the enable, where the uh, levitation happens. So when we type, when we say enable, then the mover will then rise off of the table. Our default flying height is uh, two millimeters, but uh, we can get to four or five millimeters off the table if required. Obviously remember that in when you're looking at uh, magnetic force, force falls off of the square of the distance, right? So the higher you go, you need exponentially more power to maintain that distance with the same load. Just keep that in mind. If there's not, other than it just looking really stinking cool, if there's not a reason to fly higher than say a millimeter or two, then you know you can you can leave that as default. An application where you might you know raise up would be you know if you fly around at maybe one millimeter, maybe two, and then you need to engage in tooling. You come up you know a couple millimeters, you know the tooling engages, and something happens, and then you come down and then you leave the station. A really really clean way that typically you would have had to have you know linear actuators or you know, also, you know, some different linkages some mechanical linkages, you know, to, to press down, you know, some sort of a, of a fixture, you know, to engage the part. Now we can just simply raise the, the uh, mover into the tooling, engage, disengage, and then move out. We've got our, uh, our little triggers right here for the mover. I have prepared something for you that will, Jacob will add as a download. Okay. So let's talk about this briefly here. Okay. So you'll recognize our lay, our tile layout here in light blue. So I've got these 12 tiles that we talked about, and I've got some points around the screen. So we're gonna deal with point one, point two, point three, point four, and then point five, okay? So we've got 120 by 120, and this is point one. Point four is in line with point one. I just left that um, assumed. And just as just a, an example of these points here, you can have them. They do not have to be in the center of the tile. Just to reiterate that, you know, this guy right here is, you know, 616.4 by 182.7. Who cares? That's great. Excellent. You know, if that's where, you know, where your station ends up, that's fantastic. The only thing to keep in mind is that at this point, you are limited to a plus or minus 10. You might be able, depending on payload, you might be able to get plus or minus 15 degrees at this point, but you are going to be limited to that ability for rotation. You will not get rot continuous rotation at this point here or say this point here. For a lot of applications that is not required. So this guy here is at 500 and 
he is at 518.5. So you do have, you can, you've got this entire area to set your points up. I'm staying in the centers just because it um, just because it makes sense. So we'll jump it back and forth between this picture. If you want to download it, you can so that we can make our array of points and then we will get going. <laughs> 